Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Raphael, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, our first speaker is Ken Warner, who is the Avidis Donabedian Distinguished University Professor Emeritus of Health Management and Policy at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, where he's been on the faculty from 1972 to 2017. An economist, Ken earned his PhD from Yale University. He served on the World Bank uh, representative to negotiation on the uh, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, has been a past president of the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco. He was also founding a uh, member of the Board of Directors of the Truth Initiative and is currently a member of the Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee. Ken's uh, honors include Surgeon General's Medallion in 1988, election to membership in the National Academy of Medicine in 1996, the Luther Terry Award for Leadership in 2003, the Alton Oaksner Award um, relating smoking and disease in 2010, the Triennium Dahl Wender Award for the Society uh, in 2017. Ken Warner's uh, includes, uh, has presented in over 300 professional publications, including seven books, dating back to the 1970s. And I must say, his sage words have provided me much of the guidance in the field of tobacco control. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this uh, keynote session for what I think is going to be a fascinating and very important three days. So I, I very much appreciate uh, being invited to, to share the stage with Mitch Zeller for this purpose. Um, disclosures, first of all, I want to thank National Cancer Institute and FDA for their generosity in supporting our T cores and note that I have no conflicts of interest. I also want to thank my Castor colleagues for teaching me so much about the subject of this symposium. And in particular, I want to single out David Mendez, who has been my partner in simulation crime for more than a quarter of a century. Most everything I know about simulation is thanks to David. I often say, only somewhat jokingly, that he is the brains and the brawn behind all the modeling papers we have produced. On a serious note, my long and productive collaboration with David exemplifies one of the principal messages I hope to convey today. Regulatory science will be best informed by simulation modeling research that combines the talents of modelers with those of non-modeling researchers who bring different perspectives and skill sets to the research. In introducing this symposium, I'm not going to say much of anything today that will be new to modelers. Rather, my hope is to inform other researchers about the value of simulation modeling and how their knowledge and their research methods can work with modeling to contribute to informing and guiding tobacco regulatory science. So why modeling? Well, first of all, as the obvious answer is, we want to address questions and issues that are of interest and importance, and they all tend to be rather complex lots of variables, lots of interactions among them, and so on. Frankly, the real answer here is why modeling is because we can't address these questions effectively without modeling. Frequently, we're interested in future outcomes. What's going to happen 10 years from now uh, in terms of smoking prevalence? We can't wait 10 years to find out. We have to be able to make projections, and that's what modeling allows us to do. It provides us input for decision-making on adopting interventions or weighing alternative interventions. And by the way, this applies for the business world as well as it does for public sector organizations, uh, regulators, and so on. Josh Epstein really gave some perspective on why we do this kind of modeling when he noted that we're using a model whenever we try to project a future outcome. Generally, that's an implicit model. It's, it's just in our heads with assumptions not specified, uh, no, no way of assessing internal consistency. We don't know the logical consequences. 
and we don't have any relationship to actual data. Therefore, as he put it, and I quote, the choice is not whether to build models, it's whether to build explicit ones. When we build explicit models, we understand precisely what assumptions are being made. We understand what happens when we change those assumptions, how that impacts the, the findings of the study. The results are replicable and the results are data driven. So simulation modeling in public health is now widespread. It's used for a wide range of purposes. I suspect that everybody in this audience and indeed probably in the public in general is aware that a major use of it is in projecting the likely course of infectious diseases or determining what control measures are likely to achieve over time. Uh, I mention that because we've seen a lot of modeling related to COVID-19 and we've seen a lot of guidance as to where we are headed with either the disease itself or with the success in controlling it with vaccination that has come out of modeling. More generally, um, modeling is being used to try to develop a national plan to address future infectious diseases, epidemics within our country, pandemics around the world. And it also is used to understand the evolution of chronic disease uh, epidemics. Obesity is one area where it's been applied. Obviously, as we're all interested in, in this particular uh, series of uh, talks, smoking. And it can be used to assess the cost effectiveness of alternative approaches to reducing the health effects of diseases. Now, what can simulation modeling contribute specifically to tobacco control? There are lots of answers to this. I'm not going to go through this list right now, but rather I'll return to this list and go over each of these individually a bit later. I did want to note, however, one element of special rel relevance. The Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act of 2009 requires FDA to employ, uh, to employ a public health standard. That means that they have to evaluate population health impacts. That's a new field of regulatory science for FDA. If you think about most of what FDA does, we're certainly most familiar with the approval or non-approval of drugs. The standard there is individual patient safety and efficacy. Assessing population health is much more challenging, and frankly, it's probably much more important. This means that simulation modeling is going to be an important method for evaluating modified and novel tobacco products going forward. So there are two principal categories of model types that you see here. I'm gonna describe each in very general terms. You'll see examples of both of them throughout the symposium, and learn more about how models are structured and used. We want to start with the compartmental models. These are the aggregate models. They track aggregate quantities describing homogeneous groups. So the single most obvious one for our purpose is the total number of smokers in the U.S. population tracked over time. The way these models work is they have stocks and flows. So the stock could be the aggregate quantity of interest representing a homogeneous group. In this instance, the number of smokers, perhaps in the initial year of the simulation. The flow are the variables that influence the rate of transition among the stocks. So smoking initiation rate, a cessation rate, and even the death rate will determine how you move from the stock of smokers in one year to the stock of smokers in the next year, and then to the stock of smokers in the third. Note that these homogeneous groups can be subgroups of the population and subgroups within a model. For example, we may divide the overall population into age and gender groups. Each of these groups smoking prevalence, initiation and cessation rates may differ from those of the other groups and they can vary over time. But within each of these groups at a given point in time, all members of the group are treated as if they are identical. One variation on the aggregate model that I'll have no more to say about than this right here, the system dynamics models, uh, they're characterized by a great deal of complexity, uh, nonlinear interactions, feedback effects, and so on. Agent-based models are tracking individuals 
as they interact with their environment and other individuals through social networks. The structure of these models has three components. The agents themselves, these are the individuals who have unique traits that are followed throughout the simulation. And then their attributes. What are the traits of interest? For example, age, gender, socioeconomic status, smoking status, and rules. The behavior of the agents as they interact with each other and with their environment. Let me give you an example of a rule. If a non-smoking young person interacts with a same age smoker, the interaction will increase the probability that the non-smoking individual will initiate smoking. Now, how do we choose which characteristics of the groups or individuals we want to include in our models? Well, it depends very much on the purpose of the model. Let me give an example of that. If modelers are interested in the effects of menthol cigarettes, their models obviously have to distinguish menthol from non-menthol smokers and differentiate initiation and cessation rates by type of cigarette. If they're not interested in menthol as an issue, they can simply study all smokers together and use rates of initiation and cessation that are effectively averaged across the two types of cigarettes. There are lots of models used in tobacco control simulation studies. We'll hear about others than what you see on here as well uh, during the next three days. But the three models you see here are the basic models used by the lead investigators in our T-cores. All three have been used frequently and have performed admirably. I'll give you an example, uh, perhaps immodestly, uh, but with our U of M model, calibrated with data through 1995, we hit the actual National Health Interview Survey reported prevalence a decade later, precisely, that is to the exact 10th of a percentage point. However, five years later, we overestimated prevalence by six tenths of a percentage point. Note that a large federal excise tax increase was adopted in 2009, and that likely drove prevalence down. So this illustrates both the strength and limitations of simulation models. They can be designed to accurately forecast the outcomes deriving from existing flows, in this case, initiation and cessation rates. But they can't always anticipate specific changes in the environment, such as new policies like that 2009 tax that alter those flows. They can include alternative assumptions about flows that attempt to anticipate possible changes in smoking initiation and cessation rates in response to policy changes or other influences. So you've seen this slide before. It identifies what modeling studies focused on tobacco control can contribute with each contribution useful for assisting tobacco regulatory decision-making. I'm now gonna go through them one by one and give you examples of each. So the most obvious purpose of these models is to forecast smoking prevalence and health outcomes frequently under a variety of different circumstances or conditions. Uh, one important application is goal setting. I suspect most of you are familiar with the Healthy People Goals for the Nation. Every 10 years, uh, Department of Health and Human Services issues a new set of goals in all areas of public health to be achieved ideally 10 years later. So how has modeling been used uh, as it relates to these goals? Well, one example is something that David Mendez and I published in the year 2000, shortly after the 2010 goals uh, had been produced. And we demonstrated why the 2010 smoking prevalence goal was plainly and simply unattainable. It would have required changes in the initiation rate, smoking initiation rate and smoking cessation rate that just basically were not conceivable. Now, another approach to that 2010 prevalence goal took a, a very different uh, attack at it. And I think this is interesting. David Levy and his colleagues published a paper in 2010. The goal had not been achieved in 2010, but they asked what would it take to actually achieve it three years later by 2013. And it turns out it would have required very aggressive tobacco control measures to achieve that goal in 2013. And needless to say, it was not achieved. I, I suspect many of you are familiar that there's seven countries around the world that have committed to a tobacco end game. And I should use the word commitment loosely because when I say commitment, 
they've said they want to achieve a smoke-free or tobacco-free country by some year. It ranges from 2030 to 2045. With the possible exception of New Zealand, none of them have developed very explicit plans or put resources behind that. In the U.S., we haven't had an explicit uh, commitment to a smoke-free or tobacco-free end game, but we do have Healthy People 2030 setting the goal of reducing smoking prevalence to 5% or less. That's the goal that is used in all of the seven countries uh, that uh, have announced that they're committed to end games. So how did the healthy people come up with this 5%? They tell us in the document that it was by using projection. Well, it turns out the projection is essentially a straight line from where we were at the time the goal was developed to 2030. And what we need to appreciate is that that straight line implies greater and greater percentage improvements and decreases in smoking rates. And uh, it could be achieved, it's possible, but it would require some pretty remarkable tobacco control efforts to actually get there. And I'm, I'm not saying in this instance that it's impossible, it is at least conceivable. Now, secondly, the impacts of all the policies and interventions you see on this slide have been evaluated using multiple simulation models, in some cases with multiple interventions considered together. You'll find literally dozens, maybe scores of relevant papers if you go search the literature here. Since many simulations evaluate the impacts of various tobacco control interventions, a natural next step would be to assess the cost effectiveness of the interventions. This slide shows examples of the relatively few interventions that have been subjected to cost effectiveness and cost utility analysis. I think it's safe to say that the potential for contributions in this area greatly exceeds its realization to date. All restrictive policies and regulations produce undesired and sometimes unanticipated side effects. The two examples on this slide illustrate somewhat different situations when it comes to using models to evaluate the importance of unintended side effects. The first example, youth-oriented prevention policies for e-cigarettes, is a case in which we have empirical evidence of likely undesired effects regarding some policies, and we can use that evidence in modeling the overall implications of those policies. For example, Research indicates that imposing a minimum age of purchase for e-cigarettes is associated with increased rates of youth cigarette smoking, and we have specific estimates of how much. We also have research finding that taxing e-cigarettes, perhaps to try to discourage youth smoking, increases adult smoking. Again, we can estimate how much. As such, Simulations of the effects of each of these policies can include evidence-based parameter values for both the intended and unintended impacts. That will permit formal quantitative analysis of the net benefits or costs of these policies. In contrast, regarding nicotine reduction regulation, while we can anticipate some undesirable consequences, we have little empirical evidence on which to base specific parameter values. Indeed, the same holds for the direct desired effects. How much would a nicotine reduction regulation decrease smoking among existing adult smokers and over what period of time? How much would it reduce youth initiation of smoking? Modeling can still help here, but it will require creative use of sensitivity analysis. An example of this is the analysis by Ben Appleberg and his colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018 which evaluated the nicotine reduction policy with use of sensitivity analyses. In all such cases, modelers will need to use logic, existing evidence, and perhaps developed evidence. For example, through use of expert elicitations, as did Appleberg et al., to estimate the attainment of desired objectives. Since they will not know the outcomes with confidence, they will need to test the effects of a range of estimates. Second. They'll need to do the same with regard to undesired side effects. It seems likely that a nicotine reduction regulation would be accompanied by some efforts to get around the policy, including possibly black market sales of regular cigarettes. 
and novel technologies to restore nicotine to denicotinize cigarettes, spray on nicotine, or nicotine injected into the rod of the cigarette. Once again, we have no direct empirical evidence of the likely amount of illegal activity, nor of how enforcement could decrease it. Modelers will need to make some guesstimates, and then again use sensitivity analysis to test a range of possibilities. Suffice it to say that simulation can be a very useful tool for dealing with this kind of fundamental uncertainty. That's not to say the simulation will always give you the answer. It won't. But frequently, it can put the questions in perspective, helping, for example, to identify which uncertainties are most central to developing an answer in which you can have confidence. I'll return to this two slides hence. I call this the what-if analysis. More formally, we refer to such analyses as counterfactual. Simulation modeling is an important mechanism for estimating what would have happened in the absence of an intervention that was implemented or for evaluating what effects would have accompanied the earlier use of an intervention. As an example of the former, Holford and his colleagues used micro simulation modeling drawing on extensive earlier work by the CISNET consortium to evaluate what have happened, excuse me, what would have happened to smoking in the absence of all the tobacco control efforts that date from publication of the first Surgeon General's report in 1964. The analysis led to the conclusion that from 1964 to 2012, 17.7 million smoking-related deaths had occurred in the US. However, 8 million additional deaths would have occurred had it not been for those public health initiatives. This study demonstrated why CDC ranked tobacco control as one of the 10 most important public health contributions of the 20th century. The other kind of counterfactual addresses the question of what would have happened had an intervention been adopted earlier than it was. Two examples with contemporary relevance will illustrate this ni nicely. In late February, Tuile and David Mendez published a paper that uses David's simulation model to address the counterfactual question of what would have happened if menthol cigarettes were not available in the cigarette market beginning in 1980. The paper estimated that there would have been some 10.1 million fewer smokers between 1980 and 2018 and 378,000 fewer premature smoking produced deaths. This is the kind of evidence that should serve FDA's stated interest in banning menthol in cigarettes and other combusted tobacco products. The second example is a study published last year by Levy and colleagues in which the authors used the CISNET model to estimate how many smoking attributable deaths would have been avoided if the tobacco industry had voluntarily implemented or indeed been required to implement a policy limiting, limiting nicotine content in cigarettes to levels incapable of sustaining addiction beginning in 1965, 75, or 85. Had that occurred, the authors estimate that from 16 to 21 million smoking attributable deaths would have been avoided. These what-if analyses are immensely useful, often providing a perspective, real insights about real public health that likely could not exist in their absence. The last two I mentioned are obviously directly germane to FDA's possible future regulation decision-making. All of the uses of simulation modeling addressed previously can help to identify research gaps and establish priorities for future modeling work. But here I wanna focus on the last two bullets. They relate to a valuable analytical tool, one I mentioned a couple of times earlier, sensitivity analysis. Many simulations require the inclusion of variables for which there are no established values, or at least no well-established values. In these instances, standard practice is to use a value that seems reasonable in the base case analysis, and then perform a sensitivity analysis in which multiple model runs examine the effect of variations in the value. In effect, testing the impact of that variable's uncertainty on the study's basic findings. Often, there'll be more than one such variable. That requires multiple sensitivity analyses. 
A sensitivity analysis will produce one of two conclusions, both of which are valuable in establishing priorities for further study. One possibility, uncertainty about the variable's true value doesn't matter because varying the number does not change the essential finding of the study. For example, that an intervention produces a net public health benefit. In this case, we learn that we do not need to invest scarce resources in trying to specify the value of the variable more precisely. Alternatively, the uncertainty does matter. Varying the number does change the essential finding of the study. For example, that might switch a positive assessment of an intervention to a negative one. In this case, we know that we need to invest in more research on, on what we have now identified to be a critically important variable. Uncertainties characterize the real world just as they do simulation models. Through techniques like sensitivity analysis, those uncertainties need not necessarily derail the analytical process and hence not the regulatory process either. All right, I want to look briefly at uh, what we're going to be doing, thinking about simulation modeling as we move forward. Uh, subject matter. Uh, there are going to be a lot of issues of possible contemporary relevance to FDA. One of them we know is of relevance to FDA, and that's the menthol ban. We've had some several studies on that already, and we have more of them in the works and coming out in print soon. Nicotine reduction. In addition to the Appleberg study, uh, these studies date back all the way to Tang's and her colleagues in 2005. And then we have the Levy et al. study in 2020. Our TCORS project, one of our main projects, is focusing specifically on nicotine reduction. But there are other regulations that FDA might consider, but at least to this point has not announced publicly as an object of interest. For example, increasing the pH of combusted tobacco products. A higher pH makes inhalation very unpleasant. Establishing maximum yields of various carcinogens. Uh, there have been cigarettes on the market that claim to have reduced some of the major known carcinogens by 70 to 80 percent. Regulation of flavors and non-combusted products. That's a subject that lends itself very nicely to simulation modeling. Whether FDA chooses to permit or prohibit the marketing of various alternative products. We're seeing simulation models used in providing evidence to FDA about this from the manufacturers of these products, as well as from others. But there are also issues relevant to policymaking outside of FDA. Uh, the effects of heavy taxation of combusted products and low taxation of non-combusted products is an obvious place where simulation could provide us important insights for policies that FDA has no control over. I wanna turn now just briefly to methods and uh, just a couple of observations here. Um, there's been some discussion about developing standards of good practice for modeling, uh, particularly for modeling and tobacco control, although it could be for modeling public health more generally. But should we, for example, have standards for base case or status quo assumptions so that all models are using the same initial assumptions and we'd be able to compare them more directly in that sense? At the other end of uh, the sort of extreme, the other extreme of uh, uh, methods issues, is there a role for artificial intelligence in modeling for tobacco regulatory science? Uh, that has been used in the COVID modeling. So I think it's a completely reasonable to think that we may see some AI modeling for tobacco regulatory science. I'm not saying we'll see it soon. I don't know if we'll see it ever, but it's certainly a real possibility. Um, I mentioned earlier, by the way, it's not on the slide, but uh, using modeling to produce more cost, cost effectiveness analyses, it really has been used relatively infrequently. And yet that's a very important sort of addition to what modeling does well anyway. And then finally, establishing standards for educating other tobacco control researchers about modeling. Should we be doing that? With regard to this point, I hope the symposium may lead non-modeler researchers to develop productive collaborations with colleagues skilled at modeling, as it has in the case of David and myself 
that's a win-win situation. I can think of no better way to end this introduction to our symposium than by quoting the final conclusion of Appendix 15.1 of the 50th Anniversary Surgeon General's Report in 2014. And I quote, in the next phase of tobacco control, models will be a key tool for designing strategies to address groups with high rates of prevalence and to hasten the end of the tobacco epidemic, end quote. Incidentally, uh, this appendix is a superb source for more detailed coverage of what I've touched upon today. Like you, I'm looking forward to learning a lot over the next three afternoons. And I'm excited now to hear from the guy who sits behind the desk with the sign that reads, the buck stops here. My good friend, Mitch Zeller. I appreciate your attention.